guys, I have an update about Sploot. <laughs> My new baby crested gecko. So I brought him out for some feeding and for some handling the other day and he freaked out and he dropped his tail and he is now a frog butt. Oh no, Sploot. Where'd your tail go, buddy? Oh no. <laughs> so Sploot is going to be absolutely fine. Crested geckos do often drop their tails when they're startled. So he is forevermore a frog butt. But I thought I would just show you Sploot because he's adorable and we love him even though he is a frog butt. <coughs> Hey what's up creatures, it's Em and welcome back to my channel. Today's video is all about feeder insects. If you are brand new to my channel, welcome. My name's Em, I'm a former zookeeper and I'm a digital animal educator. If you haven't already, remember to hit that subscribe button down below, become part of the creature crew and also hit that notification bell down in the corner there so you don't miss a single upload. Also, as much as I would love to say that these are real, um, this tattoo on my neck and the tattoos on my fingers and my hands, they're not. They're actually temporary, um, but they are by Inkbox, not sponsored. I just wanted to try out a different look, so I did and I posted a bunch of pictures on my Instagram. Instagram if you wanted to go and check those out. Boom. In today's video I will be covering the most commonly found feeder insects in North America. This includes crickets, mealworms, superworms, dubia roaches and horned worms. Today's video would not have been possible without the help of the amazing Josh's frogs. If you would like to go and check out the different kinds of live feeders that Josh's frogs have to offer, feel free to go down into the link in my description box and that will take you over to Josh's frogs. And before we jump into today's video, I just want to put a note out there to say please do as much research as you can when choosing feeder insects for your animals. Don't just rely on one care sheet or one YouTube video. Please do as much research as you can. The other disclaimer I'd like to put out there is you should never feed a wild caught insect or invertebrate to your private collection of animals. You just don't know what they could be harboring. Crickets in general are pretty dirty when you bring them in from the outside. I mean they can have horsehair worms which are just bleh. Find a reputable source of feeder insects like Josh's frogs. Again the link is down in my description box below. Also if you have any questions leave them down below or feel free to share your knowledge and tips with everybody else down in the comment section. Now something to bear in mind when you are feeding feeder insects to your pets is your pets are only getting the same quality nutrition as your feeders. This is why it's so important to gut load your feeders. Gut loading is the process of feeding your feeder insects to ensure maximum nutrition for your pets. Because without feeding your feeder insects, you're essentially feeding a moving exoskeleton which doesn't have that much nutritional value for your pets. Something else that you're going to want to do, depending on who you are feeding your feeder insects to, is dusting with calcium and not forgetting to add vitamins as well, or vitamins. Calcium is so important to add to your feeder insects, especially for those reptiles which rely heavily on UVB. So make sure that you do invest in a quality calcium dust, and also be aware that not all calcium dusts are going to contain additional vitamins and supplements for your reptiles, so be sure to read your labels and do additional research depending on the species that you are keeping. Common feeder number one, crickets. Crickets have a multitude of benefits. For one, they come in a huge variety of sizes, everything from tiny micro crickets to large adult sized crickets as well. They're easy to find, relatively cheap, and they're really easy to keep. When setting up crickets here at home, I use a critter keeper, just like this one over here. I put in some egg cartons with no substrate because I feed all of my feeder insects very, very quickly within the first 24 to 48 hours, and I make sure that they're able to get away from one another and to hide. I do this by giving them egg cartons to hide in and also just to climb in for extra enrichment. My crickets don't need any additional heat because I'm not breeding them and because also in this room it's always about 78 degrees so it's nice and toasty in here. The downside to keeping crickets as feeders is they can be loud really really loud. However with my Josh's Frogs delivery I got banded crickets and they are so nice and quiet so I would highly recommend that if like me you get inexplicable rage uh, when you hear an escapee cricket just driving you mad it's like just just please be quiet or die whichever one comes first and is easiest for you. 
That's so harsh. <laughs> the other downside to keeping crickets is that they have a tendency to nibble on the slower moving reptiles. I've seen this with crested geckos in particular, and I've also seen this with amphibians. So when you are feeding off your crickets to your various animals, please make sure that you're only feeding a couple of them at a time and make sure that they're actually being eaten. When feeding crickets to lizards in particular, a really good rule of thumb to live by is never to feed a cricket that is any larger than the space between the width of the lizard's eyes. One of the positives when feeding crickets to your animals is that they are super kinetic and very, very fast. They like to move around and they also like to climb, which means that they attract the interest of movement-driven reptiles. Crickets also like to climb, which means that they can also attract the attention of arboreal species that might not necessarily want to come down to the ground to feed. So there's another positive as well. Crickets are around 15% protein and 3% fat. Next up, I want to talk to you about mealworms and superworms. On the surface, mealworms and superworms don't look that different. Essentially, superworms look like a beefier version of a mealworm, but they're actually very different with very different nutritional values. When it comes to storing mealworms and superworms, they have very different needs indeed. So you do not want to be storing them together, even though they both look almost the same. Both mealworms and superworms like to burrow, and they need to have a nice dry environment so I keep my mealworms and my superworms in oats just regular organic rolled oats and they will love to burrow down in these. Superworms, also sometimes known as moria worms, are quite sensitive to changes in temperature so you don't want to keep them too cold or too warm because they will just instantly die. So you want to make sure they're nice and dry and also that they're at about room temperature or just a bit warmer than room temperature. Mealworms, on the other hand, are really versatile in terms of how they can be kept, especially in terms of temperature. You can keep them at room temperature. They also tend to thrive at slightly warmer temperatures instead of just room temperature. And if you accidentally order too many, you can even refrigerate them and they will go into a very nice dormant state and it will delay pupation. So it means that you can keep them for weeks and sometimes even months. So how do mealworms and superworms measure up in terms of nutrition for your pet? Well, it's actually quite fascinating because mealworms are about 20% protein, whereas superworms are about 17% protein. So when it comes to protein, mealworms win. So that was protein, but now let's talk about the fats. When it comes to fat content, mealworms have less fat than superworms. They have about 13% fat, whereas superworms have 16% fat, which means that the superworm has less protein and more fat and the mealworms have more protein with less fat. However, there is a huge difference when it comes to calcium because when it comes to calcium content, hands down the winner is the superworm. Superworms contain a fantastic 11% of calcium whereas mealworms not so much, only about 3% calcium. So if you are feeding any of your animals mealworms, be sure to dust with calcium, for sure. Both mealworms and superworms are terrific borrowers. So if you're putting them into an enclosure where you're going to be feeding a, a reptile or an amphibian, be sure to put them in a dish or something that they cannot escape out of. And a word of caution when it comes to feeding superworms to any reptile or amphibian that doesn't have a nice powerful set of jaws is it's always good measure to crush the head of the superworm. There have been some pictures that have circulated for years now and rumors of superworms actually um, biting the inside of uh, different reptiles and amphibians and causing issues. There's even been some urban legends that they can actually like eat their way out of a reptile. I personally don't believe this, but I do believe that they can cause a lot of discomfort. And certainly if you've ever been bitten by one of these superworms, it hurts, okay, it hurts. So you can also use tongs if you want to, um, but do make sure that you crush the head if you're going to be feeding it to any kind of animal that doesn't really like to chew for itself. So I'm not too worried about bearded dragons or tegus, but I would be a bit worried about crested geckos, gargoyle geckos, potentially leopard geckos as well. So so if you want to do an extra favor for your animals, just get a pair of tweezers or tongs and crush the head. 
Something else to bear in mind when feeding mealworms is that they have a lot of chitin. Chitin is a structural component of arthropod skeletons, fish scales, fungi cells, and mollusk shells. Although not harmful for most reptiles to consume, if it's fed too often, it can cause a chitin buildup in the gut and lead to impaction. Impaction is when an animal has an internal blockage and can't pass eggs or eliminate waste, which is very serious and a veterinarian should be consulted. Impaction from eating mealworms is rare, but it's just something for you to bear in mind. Superworms are not high in chitin. Next up, we're coming on to what is absolutely, hands down, ouch, hands down, my favorite feeder insect, which is available here in North America, and that is the dubia roach. Now, there are a lot of people that are very squeamish when it comes to roaches, but I just say get over it because, you know, you've got to feed, animals got to eat, so feed them what's good. And dubia roaches have so many benefits. When it comes to sourcing dubia roaches, they are a very common feeder in many states, although they are sadly prohibited in some states, so I'm really, really sorry. Florida, I am looking at you. I'm so sorry that you can't have dubia and you're all missing out. But they are readily available throughout much of the United States, and they have a wide variety of benefits. When you do bring home dubia roaches, you want to set them up, and they're super easy to set up. I just put them in a cricket keeper. I don't give them any kind of substrate. I give them egg cartons to hang out in and they are literally happy like that and then they all die because I feed them off really really quickly to my animals. <laughs> When I set up my dubia roaches, all I do is I put them in a small critter keeper. I put in either some rolled up newspaper so that they can burrow, or I also throw in there some egg cartons as well so that they can climb and get some space from one another. They are just easily kept at room temperature, although this room is like slightly above normal room temperature at about 78 degrees. I found that they do really, really well at this temperature. And the great thing about keeping them is that they last up to 22 to 24 months. So they last a really, really long time if you buy them in bulk. They're also odorless even when they die. So that's also another perk because if you've ever kept crickets, when they die, they can produce a rancid smell. So if you do not like that kind of gross, like dead cricket smell, do be a roaches. Dubia roaches. And unlike many other feeders, dubia roaches cannot climb slippery surfaces, so plastic and glass will keep them nice and contained. But there is also a downside to dubia roaches, and that is that they are really, really good at squeezing themselves into small, difficult to reach places. So initially, when you put them in an enclosure, they are gonna be moving around and they're gonna trigger really good feeding responses because just like crickets, they're very fast. However, they're also really good at hiding. So if you don't feed them in a dish that they can't can't escape from, they will find a way to either burrow or squeeze themselves into really difficult to get places. And they might just sit there, they might just die like under a food dish, They, so many things can happen where your animal doesn't get to benefit from the dubia. So do be sure to put them in a dish and that way your animal can actually find them. Unlike crickets, dubia roaches cannot jump and they don't have a tendency to nibble on any amphibians or reptiles that they share a space with. So they're a nice, safe and easy way to feed a reptile provided that you are giving your animals the right size. Dubia roaches are roughly 23% protein and 7% fat. And finally, we're coming on to the most beautiful and the juiciest of juicy feeders, the mighty horned worm. Hornworms are actually moth larvae. They are so beautiful. They're this gorgeous minty, almost bluey green color. And they're called hornworms because on their rear end, they have this thing that looks like a really sharp spiky horn, but it's actually really soft, so you don't have to worry about it. It won't stab you or your animals. Hornworms must taste absolutely delicious because I've never met an insectivorous animal that didn't love horned worms. However, they are also very, very expensive, so maybe best as a treat. Horned worms tend to arrive in a container which is clear and cylindrical, which looks like this. They grow so, so, so quickly, especially when they eat the food that they come with during shipping. When given the right food, a horned worm, which is no bigger than a nail clipping, can balloon in size to something that's as thick as your finger. So be sure to keep an eye on your horned worms and make sure you're feeding your animals at the correct size. When storing a horned worm colony like this, I actually don't keep them this way up. What I 
find is that they will tend to eat and also defecate and that kind of fouls up the food that they have down here which can last them a few days. So all of this down here, the darker color that you can see, that is already food that has been through the hornworm systems and this can build up and start to foul a lot of the uh, food that's actually at the bottom here. So the way that I recommend storing your hornworms is actually this way. So they will be able to climb up, they will be able to eat their food, but their droppings will fall to the bottom here. Now I already mentioned that I do not condone feeding any wild caught insect to your animals because of parasites, but I really mean it with hornworms. A lot of people find hornworms on their tomato plants. Do not feed these to your animals because the tomato plant has sedative properties and this can poison your animals. Do not chance feeding wild caught feeders. It's just not not worth it, especially wild caught hornworms. In terms of actual protein, hornworms are not particularly great because they're only about 9% protein. However, if you are particularly looking for a feeder insect with a high moisture count, hornworms are for you because they take the prize for the most commonly found feeder insect in North America with the highest moisture content at 85%. 85% water, 9% protein. It's a treat. It's a fun treat. Especially a treat for the eyes. And that is it for today's video about feeder insects. I hope you learned something different. Let me know what your favorite feeder insect is down in a comment below. And thank you so much to Josh's Frogs for collaborating with me on today's video. Thank you guys all so much for watching. I will see you in another video soon. Bye!